All right, we're going to get going in just uh, about one more minute here. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, it's 12 o'clock here on the East Coast, and we're going to begin. Welcome to the New York Mid-Atlantic Consortium for Genetics and Newborn Screening Services webinar series about timeliness in newborn screening. I am Dr. Scott Schoen, Program Manager for the Newborn Screening Laboratory in New Jersey, and I'm Chair of the Newborn Screening Workgroup for NIMAC. It's my pleasure to moderate today's webinar, which is the third in our series. Today's webinar covers analytic timeliness in newborn screening. I'm going to provide a very brief introduction, and the bulk of the webinar will actually be presented by Dr. Michelle Kajana from New York. Before I begin, I'd like to remind everyone that your lines will remain on mute. To ask a question, please type it in the chat box, and we will address each question at the end of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded, and a link will be provided after the webinar is posted to our website. In addition, when the webinar ends, you will be provided with a link for an evaluation. This evaluation is very important to our, uh, to our review of the system, and we appreciate you taking a few short minutes to complete it. All right. So, Beth, if you hand it over to me, I'll go through my slides. Okay, you're all set. Great, thanks. Actually, I can advance it. Okay, try again, please. There we go. All right, so there we go. Today's, today's topic, as I said, is analytic timeliness and be uh, presented in large part by Dr. Michelle Kajana, and I will provide the next few slides. <clears throat> So, so far in our webinar series, we've had um, two discussions, uh, an overview by, uh, by Sarah Vile, and then a discussion of pre-analytic timeliness uh, two weeks ago by Ali Peaks. And thus far, we've covered largely up to, where the, up to and through where the specimen is transported to the laboratory. Today's discussion will take us from receipt of the specimen in the laboratory through reporting of results out from the laboratory in the program's follow-up program. I want to take a, a, just two minutes to review why we're taking on these discussion topics. And, and what you have on the screen in front of you are the national recommendations that came from the Secretary's Advisory Committee. Um, Michelle will cover this in more detail during her slides. But in essence, the topics focus around the reporting out of results in a timely fashion. And we've decided in NIMAC to address this through the webinar series by covering the entire system and addressing how timeliness can be improved throughout the process. What you have here is what I just showed from text into graphical format, where the pre-analytic is usually post-birth, day one, day two, and maybe part of day three from birth through collection and transport. And we're going to pick up today with Dr. Gajana's talk, talking about from receipt through the reporting of critical results on day five, and then ultimately, hopefully, all of result, all pr um, presumptive positive results by the end of day seven. And so, <clears throat> I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Kajana. Dr. Michelle Kajana received her doctoral degree from the Harvard School of Public Health and completed postdoctoral work in clinical molecular genetics at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She is board certified in clinical molecular genetics by the American Board of Medical Genetics and she's a fellow of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Dr. Gajana has been employed with the Wadsworth Center since 1996, where she currently is Deputy Director of the Division of Genetics, Chief of Laboratory and Human Genetics, and Director of the Newborn Screening Program. She is involved in many national newborn screening efforts and works with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Association of Public Health Labs, or APHL. She is chair of the Molecular Subcommittee for APHL and co-chair for APHL's Newborn Screening and Genetics and Public Health Committee. Dr. Kajana's laboratory has developed several new newborn screening tests, 
and uses DNA technology to study frequencies of specific gene mutations in dried blood spots in the context of newborn screening. And I'll hand the webinar over to Dr. Kajana. Okay, thank you very much, Scott, for that introduction. And um, thanks to everyone for taking time out of their day in order to join us this afternoon. Um, at least on the East Coast, it's actually afternoon. Um, so I'd like to just get started. Do I have the slide? There we go. So this is a uh, first slide just to sort of set the stage to refresh us in what we do in newborn screening. Um, this is a picture of a field of poppies in Israel from Dr. Sue Gross. She um, has this nice field of poppies. And in newborn screening, our goal is actually to do a risk assessment and find that one baby who's at the highest risk, or a white flower in this picture. And we're interested in doing this on a population-wide basis. And we do this because we want to ensure healthcare equality across the entire state and program. The other thing I want to emphasize is that this is really a, a population-based risk assessment, and it's a screen. It's not a diagnostic test. And so when people manage results coming out of the laboratory, it's really important to keep that in mind. The next slide is a picture of the entire newborn screening system, what Scott alluded to. Um, and this slide is compliments of Dr. Susan Tanksley from the Texas Newborn Screening Program. We're going to focus today on the bottom sort of section of this um, diagram. But you can appreciate all the players that are influencing us when we, talk, when we try to think about timeliness in newborn screening. It sounds quite simple when you just say it in those few words. But you realize you have to include all of these players when you're considering this. The topic of today, as I said, is just really looking at the analytic piece of um, this slide. So we're going to focus on the bottom. And we sort of heard some of the other ends of it in the previous two webinars. So we can break up our observations into three parts. And these all are involved in the laboratory, both in the laboratory, in the newborn screening program, and also on either end, which is the specimen receipt and uh, co collection and receipt, and then the post-analytic is after the reporting. Um, so when we talk about pre-analytic, we talk about um, the specimen collection, the labeling and the requisition order, uh, transport of the specimen, receipt in the laboratory, and then accessioning in the laboratory. So it blends between the outside hospital and uh, provider and then flows into the lab as part of the pre-analytical phase. The analytical phase is the actual sample preparation and what we refer to in newborn screening as the test. So the series of tests that we do on those specimens after they arrive in the laboratory. The post-analytical phase is the actual interpretation of the results, the reporting of the results, and we extend that to the outside medical community to the diagnosis and treatment and then reporting back to the program on the outcomes of, for that infant. That's important not only from a timeliness standpoint, but also from a quality improvement standpoint to ensure that our tests are working as good as they can. So Scott just showed this slide, and it's a nice, uh, what I like to emphasize here is that newborn screening programs routinely do all of these, uh, look at all of these points along the way to improve what we do. Um, so we have what we call continuous quality improvement. And people working in hospitals are very familiar with this. You always want to try and make things um, as good as possible. So um, we're going to focus, like I said, on, on this angle here. And we'll focus on the, the post-analytic in another uh, talk coming up in August. These are the same timeliness guidelines that Scott just showed you. Um, but I broke them up into the pre-analytic phase and the analytic post-analytic. So the top purple pieces are the pre-analytic, and then the um, kind of greenish-blue is the uh, analytic and post-analytic. So we undertook a, a look in our newborn screening program to try and determine how we would be able to meet these recommendations. These recommendations came about um, because of uh, 
a series of things that happened about three years ago um, where a child had a delayed diagnosis. And the Secretary's Advisory Committee up, uh, took this up as um, something that they would look at on a federal level to make these recommendations on how um, <clears throat> specimens should be handled and the results reported. They emphasized that they divided things up into time critical conditions, <coughs> excuse me, and then all other conditions. <clears throat> so we're going to look at both, and we're going to look at a couple examples um, at the end of the talk today. There's an awful lot of time and energy being spent working on this in all newborn screening programs across the country. Um, but I'm going to focus today on the methods that we utilized in New York because uh, I'm most familiar with those. So then going back to sort of the beginning, what things can we control? We can't control when a baby's born. They're born 24-7. We can't typically control down to basic universal hospital practices of when they actually are able to collect specimens. This uh, involves not only processes in the hospital, but it also involves the actual health of the infant. And both of these things can be impacted um, by, collection can be impacted by the health of the infant and hospital practices. We also rely on hospitals and providers to collect suitable samples and to do that in a timely fashion. And we know that nurseries are very busy places. And so a lot of the pre-analytic um, timeliness measures that we try to look at have influences that are sort of out of our control at this point. Many hospitals send their specimens down to a laboratory, which are also tend to be quite busy. Um, and then at some point, a courier or a driver or some person picks up samples and transports them to the laboratory. Once they get to the laboratory, we're sort of, um, we take control over, over the processes. So this is sort of pre-analytic in a pictorial form for you to take up for a refresher. Now, as I said, once we're in-house, we even have pre-analytic steps. So we have to prepare our uh, plates for the day's work. We have to receive the mail. So when it comes into the laboratory, open it and accession it. We have to look at samples for quality. Some samples come in not looking quite so good. And we have to figure out which samples are testable. We then bundle the specimens and we punch them into the trays that you see in the upper left-hand corner. And at this point now, we're actually ready to focus on the analytic phase. So what I've tried to emphasize for you is that there's a lot that goes on in newborn screening prior to the samples arriving in-house. And then even once they arrive in-house, the pre-analytic piece is fairly large. And what we found is that a lot of it seems to be a bit out of our control. So what do we actually have control over? And the one thing we have is control over what we actually do in the laboratory or the analytics phase. So this is the big question that we're going to address for you today. And in New York last summer, we took over a, sort of a, a mini process improvement. So informally, we got um, a series of individuals in our lab together. We included people from data entry, from follow-up, and from all of the laboratory sections. And we just looked at what we do on a daily basis and what the timing of each laboratory, uh, what the timing of each laboratory and what their practices are. And we put in place a couple of measures that helped us trim down um, some of the sort of waste, if you will. When we reported back to the higher ups in our department, we were um, allowed to use a more formal process called Lean. And so we uh, had a person who's a consultant work with us. And we took a much more formal look beginning in December of last year through sort of late spring of this year. And one thing that Lean does, if you're not familiar with it, is it actually stemmed out of manufacturing. And it, I believe, is used in a lot of sort of assembly line type um, and then all the way down to now, laboratory testing. A lot of newborn screening programs became familiar with Lean. And when you think about it, you start to look at how you're wasting time and energy. So once you look through each of these boxes, you can see that you can have waste and transportation. Do people walk around a lot to do their work? Is there unnecessary movement? Now, again, keep in mind a lot of these wastes were um, 
were kind of labeled based on production or manufacturing. People, are people underutilized? Are they busy all day? Are they underdeveloped? Um, can you spend time making people more efficient? Can you engage their ideas in the laboratory and uh, help and engage them in process improvement? Do we overproduce? Do we run unnecessary reports? Do we make more copies of things than we need? Um, do we have redundant logs? Those types of things. We looked at defects. Where do we have errors? Do we have hospital data, incorrect data entry, um, miscommunication between sections or failures in equipment? Um, from a laboratory perspective, equipment failures are handled quite quickly, but some of these other issues take up some time. Do we have overprocessing? Do we have redundancy in what we do? Do we have unnecessary strings of approvals or sign-offs in order to release things? Or are all those things actually necessary? Do we wait? Do we wait for samples or instructions? Do we wait for parts, forms, equipment, service contracts, you name it? Also inventory. Take a look at that. And then motion. A lot of times when you take tours and facilities, you'll see that there's lines painted on the ground, and those lines tell people where to go. That's sort of the extreme, but are there places where people double back or does the workflow move accordingly? And so what we did was take a look at all of these different processes within our own laboratory, and um, we had staff engaged in this formal process. Again, they came from all parts of the newborn screening program for the analytic piece, the data entry unit, the follow-up unit, and then each lab section had a representative. So the first thing that we had to do is actually define our goal. So as I alluded to earlier, we felt like at this point we didn't have enough um, we didn't have enough time to be able to assess all of the pre-analytic. So we focused on just the analytic piece. There are other things that are going on in our program and elsewhere that is looking at the pre-analytic piece. And so we worked all front, on all fronts to concentrate on what things we actually can control. The first step was to measure what the baseline is. So we found when we looked at our data that 58% of our samples are collected outside the program on day two. We needed to lay the groundwork to see, okay, when are samples getting here and how can we meet these guidelines in our laboratory based on what's happening right now? 23% uh, of the samples were collected on day one. Only about a third of the samples actually arrived in our laboratory by day three of life. So that was a piece where we, again, pre-analytic, but we knew this was going to be our baseline with which we had to work from. When we looked at our critical referrals, and the critical referrals are defined by the federal recommendations, about a third of them were happening in less than five days of life. The average was about almost seven days. Um, and that means when we actually made a phone call to the healthcare provider saying that the baby had an abnormal screen. Only about 12.5% of our non-criticals were reported in less than seven days. Our average was more like um, 9.6 days. Another thing, uh, Monica Martin did a lot of this work in the lab, found that the birthday doesn't occur, your birth date doesn't really dramatically influence the reporting schedule for our testers. Again, that was something we need to take a look at. The normal cycle time for criticals, if everything goes according to plan, was 54 hours. That was of work in the lab. And the current normal cycle for uh, criticals was 23 and a half hours. So we, we had some wins and we had some areas where we had to work a little bit harder. So the first thing that the lean group did after they looked at the data was to, to create a process map. This was a large map that was hung in the hallway. It outlined each step in the laboratory. Um, the pre-analytic is on the top. Uh, What's called pre, we call that up to pre-step four. And then we looked at our uh, pieces that we had control over in the laboratory. What we, had, what we did after that was we had each staff member take a look and post comments on ideas of things that might help each step along the way. That was quite a colorful exercise, and we got a lot of feedback from the lab staff that we were able to take a look at to lay the groundwork for changes that we were going to try. Monica uh, Martin pulled data from our laboratory looking at the overall specimen turnaround time. So on the y-axis here is the age that is reported from the day of birth to either the first call, i.e. a referral, or the printing of a, a normal mailer. 
or the results for a normal mailer when they were available. And she plotted that by day of birth, and she found that there is really no difference in the day you're born unless maybe you were born on a Thursday. The median is shown here, and these various uh, asterisks are outliers, like single outliers, and then these are sort of clustered outliers, and the little circles. So she found that the median reporting across the entire program, whether you're looking at critical or non-critical conditions, was greater than or equal to nine days. We only we made eight days if the baby was born on a Thursday. <clears throat> if we looked at our turnaround times in house, it got a little bit better. Um, here was the age reported, and this was from when the sample was received until either again the first call or a negative report plotted against the day that the sample was received. And you can see that the median here again fluctuates mostly around six days, except Mondays, which was a better day to have a specimen received, because reporting was done in about four days. So this set sort of the baseline of the type of uh, what kind of efforts we would need and what points we would need to look in order to be able to assess how we could reduce the analytic timeliness in our laboratory. They just report on Monday. So <clears throat> when you look at analytic timeless and you kind of brainstorm of pieces along the way that one could consider to improve our time, our turnaround time, you can look at lab staff, operating days, operating hours. You can look at how much time it actually takes to set up an assay, how much time it actually takes to run an assay. And can this be improved with more instruments, more people, and those sorts of questions? In labs, we love algorithms. How do we make our algorithms work better? And can we change the way we do repeat testing to improve our turnaround time? We're going to talk a bit at the end about repeat, about testing and test sensitivity and specificity when we get started you know, in, a, in a few slides. And that's going to impact this um, sort of the repeat testing. How much second tier testing do we do? So that differs from repeat testing. Repeat is I got an abnormal result. Now I'm going to run the same test in duplicate or maybe more. The same test again on another punch from that baby's card. Second tier testing means I got an abnormal result. And now I'm going to do a different kind of test to try and distinguish whether that baby truly is at risk or not. And so second tier testing generally is a new technique, a new method, and sometimes even a new lab. And most commonly, we talk about DNA testing as second tier. And then we're going to have some examples at the end of specificity and how that impacts test quality and timeliness. So the lean group um, set out to do their work. And the first thing they want to consider is what are the, what's the low-hanging fruit? That's always the first thing you want to say. What's the easiest thing that we can do that would impact how we turn around specimen reporting and testing. So the obvious thing is people, time, and money. Okay. So in most states, people, time, and money is a very arduous process to attack. We ask for people, and this actually in some ways violates some of the lean principles because just adding more people doesn't necessarily make things better. How about timing? Can we change timing of when things are done? Can we change timing of people's hours? Can we change time of how specimens are handled in the laboratory on a daily basis? And would that impact how we turn around time, how we turn around uh, results? And in fact, our informal group earlier in the summer had actually looked at timing and the changes they made impacted timeliness because they altered just the way that they the times of days that they do something. And that actually helps some of our, our um, process. Money, of course. Can we buy more things with money? We can buy more people, and we can buy equipment. We can buy different reagents, maybe. We can change our testing. Um, that's always a consideration. But we always consider these things right in light of uh, budgets. And generally, budgets are cut and not, not increased. So this is a work in progress. The next thing you might consider is, um, can we automate something? Can we automate an assay to set it up? So maybe we don't need those people, and maybe those people can do something else. When you're in an operation like a newborn screening program, a lot of times the automation ends up being slower than the human. 
Um, and so that's something that you need to consider. So you could broad brush it and say we could set up robots to do all this, but at the end of the day, people still have to pay attention to the robots, and sometimes the people are faster than the robots. Um, many of our processes are sort of, I won't say set in stone, but they're pretty firmly set, set because the way we do business, all the different laboratories have to operate and then everything has to sort of merge at the end. So you can speed something up quite well on one front, but on the end of it, you have to look across the entire program and you have to bring everything to that measure. And at some point that becomes some, uh, difficult to do. So each section's workflow is going to, going to be assessed with the people in the lab to see is there anything we can do to sort of unite across the different labs and make processes a little bit more universal and make them all kind of adhere to the same time frame because if we do impact timeliness overall, um, it has to happen on all the different fronts. The other thing that we looked at is assay time, a consideration of how much time does it actually take to do a test. A lot of that depends on test volume. So in newborn screening, we depend on the volume of samples to dictate what our instrumentation is. And a lot of uh, labs out there have the notion that newborn screening just sort of plots along as a machine. And until a couple years ago, we weren't really interested in this topic, but that's not necessarily true. We rely on types of machinery and assays that are um, reliable, that can be done every day, day in and day out, and they get the job done. In some cases, they might be faster or slower. They tend to be cheaper, and they tend to be um, able to be purchased in a larger scale so that we have redundancy in the lab, A, if something breaks down, and B, if our volume swells for some reason, such as a, a blizzard in upstate New York. We have trouble getting samples here. When the roads are cleared, we get a huge volume of samples. We have to be able to deal with that swell. In New Jersey, Hurricane Sandy, um, dealing with that type of an emergency. So things come up and we have to make sure we can get things done and assay times are set up around that. You can have some instrument that's really jazzy and might be faster but it boils down to how many of them can you afford. And so all of these considerations need to be taken into account when you're looking at impacting how much time it actually takes to do a test. So this is sort of the low-hanging fruit that people talk about, things that we can look at to determine whether or not we can impact our turnaround times in a favorable way. But one big question out there is, can timeliness actually be detrimental? In this case, are we robbing from Peter to pay Paul? Um, so we're going to be fast, but are we going to be better? And newborn screening is concerned not only with being fast, but also without, with, with being better. And so how do we maintain our quality and be timely and impact as few families as possible along the way? So in order to get a handle on this, we're going to review some test words. In the lab, we look at things like sensitivity. And sensitivity is the number of true positives, so people who actually have a disease or test positive, over the number of true positives plus false negatives, everyone with the condition. So false negatives mean that the child actually has the condition, but their, at their screen was not abnormal. And that dictates sensitivity. And newborn screening programs strive for high sensitivity. We don't like to miss babies that have any of the conditions that we're testing for. Another way to think about it is that sensitivity is actually the probability that the test detects everyone who has the condition. Again, we don't like to miss uh, babies with these conditions. That sort of impacts the whole um, mission of newborn screening in a negative way. The other test word that we think about is specificity, and that's the number of true negatives over the number of true negatives plus false positives. So that denominator is everybody without the condition. So in newborn screening, we tend to live with a higher false positive rate, and our tests sometimes have somewhat low specificity. Again, specificity is the probability that the test is negative, the screen is negative, 
and the patient is actually healthy. So historically, we always felt that the impact of a false positive was smaller than the impact of a false negative. And uh, just we've operated in setting our thresholds and our cutoff values on this basis. And so when you start to think about impacting timeliness, we want to think about how that impacts those two uh, words or probabilities. Another way to look at this is this nice grid that everybody learned if you ever took a stat class or had biology or epidemiology. The box shows the um, test positive rate here and whether or not the disease is present. And this shows another way to shows you how to calculate sensitivity and specificity. Okay. So I just defined it in words on the previous slide. On this slide, it's showing you how you would calculate based on the numbers in this grid or these boxes or it's called a two by two table. The other thing that we are interested in in newborn screening is the positive predictive value or PPV, positive predictive value. And that is the probability that those with a positive test have the disease. So you test positive and you have the disease or you test positive and you don't have the disease. This tells us actually how good the test is working. And the counter of that is the negative predictive value. So these are, where, these are um, calculations that we do in newborn screening programs to look at our algorithms and see how well everything is working. Um, and that's why we need feedback on the results from the diagnostic testing from the infant, um, the post-analytic piece, because that helps us make sure that every, everything is behaving as it should. So with that in mind, our definitions on sensitivity and specificity, we're going to take a look at a couple of examples. So this is, as I said, Labs Love Algorithms. This is our algorithm in New York for crab A screening. So if you look at the top here, all samples that come in the lab are tested for Gauss activity. We get those results on day three, and this is day three of receipt in the lab. Okay? This means that the samples come in, they get prepped, they incubate overnight, the results come off, and we have our first test result by day three of life. We do a retest of any sample that has a value less than 20% of the daily mean. It's just a calculation we do in the lab to determine whether a baby's positive or negative for crab A disease. On day four, we retest and duplicate, and we start this early in the morning, and we get those results, and we also report out to the DNA lab what the results are. When the DNA lab gets that result, and if the average of the samples is less than 12%, the DNA lab knows to kick into high gear and to start to do the DNA testing. If a sample's uh, repeat test is greater than 12% here on this side, those babies all get released and they're all screen negative. Now, keep in mind the vast majority of babies are going to be screen negative on a daily basis. So really by day four, we have those results, and that's day four of receipt. There's a couple ways we can reduce this, but there's not too, too many that we can, we can uh, help reduce timing for this specific test. But on a grand scheme, only the babies who have one or more mutations actually get referred, and so we need to wait for um, all of this to, to play out. Generally, by the time all of this is finished up, all the biochemical testing is done, the DNA results are also ready, and so both operate in concert and both labs work closely together to ensure that we can actually increase specificity and not really impact timeliness because we can't do the biochemical test much faster than we do it right now. So this example shows you, this is an example that shows you that we actually can work in the newborn screening program to increase specificity, that's the number of false positive results, by using DNA sequence analysis and that we don't lose time in that process. So for Crab-A disease, as I just showed you in that complicated algorithm, we do the biochemistry first and molecular second, but as biochemistry is wrapping up, so is the DNA test. And what it results in for us is 41.3% of the positive biochemical tests, um, we get a reduction in the number of referrals. So if we were only doing the, the uh, biochemistry test in the one laboratory without the DNA, we would be referring many more babies. And when you refer babies, we know that we increase familial anxiety greatly, especially with this condition. 
So in this case, we're doing our job. We're, we're adding a second tier test. Our timing is good. And we're also reducing uh, family anxiety. So we're releasing babies as negative that we might otherwise have reported um, to the community as possibly affected with crab A disease. And in today's technology world, the first thing parents do is go to the internet and look up the disease once they hear what the baby might be positive for. And so anxiety is actually probably increased with false positives over time than it had in the past because it was able, you were able to temper it more with medical intervention to talk to the family before they found out much about the condition. The second example that I'd like to share with you is um, increasing specificity, again, using DNA analysis. But in this uh, realm, we're actually losing some timeliness. So the issue here is that most of the referrals for cystic fibrosis screening do not have disease. And there's a fairly high false positive result. So in most programs for, new, for uh, cystic fibrosis screening, um, at least those doing a single, the single specimen state, there's an active trypsin test that's done. We call it IRT for short. And a baby has to have at least one CF causing mutation. So the way this is done in the lab is similar to CRAB A. We have one lab section that does the IRT test, and that's a protein antibody based test. And then any baby who has a 5%, uh, top 5% IRT value on each day is sent over for a DNA test. The panel that's used in most labs is somewhere between 39 and 100 mutations. But we know that there's many, many, many more mutations that cause CS. And so because of that, because we're only screening for a subset of possible mutations, we're not sequencing the entire gene, we refer any baby who has one CS mutation. Now in the Caucasian population, one in 29 people have a CS mutation. And we pick up some, but not all of the CF carriers. So we know that our, our specificity is low for this test, and we're referring a lot of babies who don't have cystic fibrosis. But because we're not sure, we make sure that we go ahead and at least introduce them to a CF specialist to have a diagnostic test, which is a sweat chloride test. And further complicating things, not all mutations, and I'm doing little air quotes here, not all CF TR mutations cause the classic form of CF. And so that also complicates um, the diagnosis for the medical community. So we took a look at data. Um, this is work of Dr. Denise Kay in our lab. And Erin Hughes was an MLS, a master's in lab science student. She looked at this for her capstone project. I'm just going to go through uh, the work that was done in the lab. So if we look at our current assay, like I said, if we have a normal IRT value, that first biochemical test, and those babies are uh, specimens are in the lowest 95% of values for that day, those babies all get released as screen negative. Now that's 95% of our infants, right? But the top 5% are the ones that we actually concentrate on. And they're the ones we're actually most concerned about. So we do now a, we, at this time in 2010 to 2013, we were doing a 39 mutation panel with a test kit from a place called Hologic. And we had several different outcomes. We could have two mutations, one mutation in the gene, or no mutations, but still really high IRT. Okay? So we had three outcomes after the mutation tests that were possible. If you're in that bottom 99.9%, .9%, you're released again as a screen negative. So the top 95, and then anybody with a high IRT, uh, high IRT but no mutations detected went out. If you had two mutations, you're referred to a specialty care center. And then you have to take that, you have to get that diagnostic sweat test. <clears throat> the data from 2010 to 2013 in New York showed that of those infants, 30 to 40 of them were referred. These are all babies with high IRT and two mutations. And out of that group, 19 to 37 cases per year were um, confirmed to have cystic fibrosis. Now you can see a change in the numbers. If we, re we refer all babies who also have one mutation, 
So for 650 infants that were sent out for a sweat test, because they had one mutation and they had high IRT, our, up, our, our uh, yield was only 9 to 26 cases over those three years. The last category we refer is babies who, despite doing the mutation test, have no mutations, but they still have pretty elevated IRT and we're concerned that maybe they have two private mutations that we're not picking up on our panel. We refer 250 babies, which are all babies that have to be followed and sweat tested, for a pickup of about one to four cases. So we're not doing real well with CF. Overall, we had 900 referrals over that time frame and we had 29 to 65 cases picked up during that time frame. So we can do better here. This is sort of another way to look at the data, and what we did was we looked at our current mutation panel, the Hologic 39, that was during that time period. We looked at another test kit that looked at 139 mutations, and then we looked at the entire gene by doing a sequencing assay using a next gen, it's called next gen sequencing, but for the sake here, we basically sequenced the entire CFTR gene, all of the coding regions. <clears throat> this shows the pickup rates that we had across the group for the Hologic test. We had 256 babies with two mutations, 114 with one, and then 22 with very high IRT. And this was the number of babies that were referred in each of those categories. So you could see when you went to 139 mutations, we had an increase in two mutes because we lost some from these categories here. Okay? And then as we went across and we actually sequenced the entire gene, the number of babies with two mutes increased over that time period. And you can see this number fell because now we picked up mutation number two in some of the one mute babies prior. Some of these babies who only had one mutation here now moved up here and the very high IRTs moved either here or up here. And so we could see that by expanding the mutation panel, we actually had a better pickup of babies in the lab. So this spawned us to take a look and see whether or not this would be practical to do in a newborn screening program in lieu of maybe doing um, the mutation panel to start. We did find, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but we did find, and we look, took a look back at all of our positive CF babies, we actually had to do even more work than just sequencing the gene. We're working on implementing this into our program now. But suffice to say, just by sequencing the whole gene doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to pick up every single child with cystic fibrosis in your program. So we revised our little algorithm. This part obviously remains the same. We're not going to change the way we do the IRT and our screen negative bottom 95%, but we might change the way we do the DNA piece. So we're going to come up with a New York specific panel, and again, we have these possible outcomes here. So you can get two mutations using this test, one mutation, or in some cases, maybe even zero mutations. The zero mutations are the babies whose um, mutations might be on that other slide I showed you just prior to this one using still other testing. By doing this TrueSeq panel, we actually do the same exact test as the sequencing assay. However, we tailor it to New York and we look at mutations that are found in our babies. If you have two mutations, you're done. But if you have one mutation or zero, now we change the bioinformatics, which means we change the way we look at the data, and we actually can get the job done without doing a whole new test as we showed prior. So we have some babies go from no mutations to two by opening up this extra data analysis, as I showed in that other slide just prior to this as well. You also can have two babies. Some babies go from one mutation previously to two. And lastly, you could have babies who get referred because we found two upstairs here in the, the true seat panel. What we found if we implement this and we looked at our data is that we reduced those 900 babies that were sent out, 900 families told their baby might be at risk for cystic fibrosis. We reduced those babies down to 100, 100 families. And so we think that probably this is a worthwhile uh, way to do business in our screening program. We're increasing the specificity an awful lot. We're decreasing the number of families that we have to notify that their child is at risk for this disease. 
and we do it with not a whole lot of loss of timeliness, but uh, a little bit. So we would see an 89% decrease in the number of referrals if we change to this new algorithm test. And we would look at our old way, which is shown on the left side of the slide here. So accessioning the IRT test in abnormal, we repeat, we repeat IRT, we extract DNA, da, 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 da. we get the end here, and we get down to at the fifth day of receipt, we actually print out a report, or we make the referral. When we move to our new testing, we have to do things a little bit different in the lab. But we get that result and that 89% reduction in referrals by tacking on two days for a fairly small portion of the population. Everyone else can be released as negative, and we concentrate on those babies um, whose families we, we want to notify with the best data possible. So we feel that even though we are increasing turnaround time, we are uh, increasing specificity enough to make it worthwhile. Now note these times, assume that we do this every day, that we don't batch specimens, and that's another issue that we're looking at. So this is an example again where we're going to sacrifice um, some time, but we think the test is going to be much, much better. And the last example is looking at similar technology to determine whether or not we can take what's done post-analytically now outside of the newborn screening program and can we move that into the newborn screening program to provide information that helps in the treatment and diagnosis or will help the post-analytic piece? Um, and so this is a project looking at the immunodeficiency disease called SCID. Now, SCID sounds like one disease, but it's actually many different disorders that are um, lumped together under that sort of broader category. Um, and it's all about uh, babies who are immunodeficient. So we know there's many genes that are involved in the disease that cause immunodeficiency and that immunologists provide better care when they know what the causative mutation in the gene is. Right now this is done, as I said, post-analytically. Once we make the referral out, then the physician makes these test orders. But can screening labs actually provide timely mutation analysis so the provider has it sort of like they have the CF information and like they have the CREVE information? And the other feeling we have is that when the public health programs provide this type of analysis, we don't have any health care disparity to be concerned about. We have um, quality and equality assured across all babies who need this kind of testing. So we don't have to worry about um, babies who can't get that care for whatever reason. So right now what we do is a, a DNA test to look at this little thing called the TREC. It's a little piece of DNA that floats around in, in very young blood when um, the T cell receptors are doing their thing and becoming available to help the baby fight off infections. <clears throat> when babies are born, they have immunity that they uh, get from their mom, and that lasts a couple of months, and then their own immune system has to kick in. When their immune system doesn't kick in, when we don't have these receptors rearrange or they don't start to be able to make antibodies, then they can suffer catastrophic illness from simple childhood infection. So the idea here is that if we know a baby has this immunodeficiency, we can protect them from these infections and we actually can treat the disease. In our program, we have a cutoff, like all do, and our immunologists generally order blood counts, flow, and mitogen studies. These are follow-up tests to determine what type of skid or if the baby actually has the immunodeficiency. And oftentimes what happens is the docs order these molecular tests sort of by how they feel, the blood count looks, what the flow data shows, and they do either a multi-gene panel or they do gene by gene, which causes a lot of issues with insurance and timeliness on the post-analytic side. So we don't get the results back whether the baby has the type of skid the baby has for quite some time in some cases. And it becomes sort of a slow, stressful process for everyone involved, whether it's the parents providers or the newborn screening programs that are looking for those results. So we have a project to look at a series of genes, and the questions we want to ask is the time shortened to diagnosis, are there fewer visits to the specialist because they know what they're dealing with, is treatment actually earlier and is it better, 
And what's the long-term follow-up after these results? Now, this obviously will be several you know, years down the road. And then we also want to create some information for parents and providers. And so this just shows the panel of the genes. They all have these kind of names um, and we're looking at. And right now we're in the process of validating our panel. And um, stay tuned. In a year or so, we'll have some data to share with you to see whether or not this type of um, process of moving analytic, post-analytic timeliness into the analytic phase actually has an impact on baby's health, which is our overall concern in doing this in the first place. So with that, I'm going to close, and I'll acknowledge um, a lot of folks who helped out with this. Suzanne's at the CDC. She provided a couple of the background slides. Monica did a lot of the lean work and data, um, the data I showed you with our lean. In addition, Amanda Showers helped her out as well in our lab. Scott, you've heard from. Um, Aaron, Denise, and Colleen worked on the CS data. And then we have all of our specialists who monitor what we do and give us valuable input. Um, and we have folks in newborn screening and in the genomic core that helps us with the, some of the next-gen technologies. And so when we're thinking about timeliness, I wanted to thank everybody, and I'll answer any questions. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate that. Um, as a reminder, the phone lines will remain on mute. That helps keep the background noise to a minimum. So if you want to ask a question, we ask that you type it into the question box. Um, and while Michelle has a chance to take a breath and maybe get a drink of water, we have a couple of questions coming in. So um, let's see. Are you all set, Michelle? Sure. sure. All right, great. So the first question that came in says, are your specimens labeled or identified in any way during transport from the hospitals? Unfortunately, our transport service lost a batch of our specimens, which required recollection from newborns at a later date. Um, yes. I, uh, well, <laughs> yes. Um, hospitals will keep, a, our hospitals tend to keep a list of specimens that they have submitted for transport. Um, we have UPS as our carrier. They have implemented in our state a pickup scan, which shows that it's mandatory for newborn screening showing that the specimen is on, en route. And then we actually have a full-time uh, person, almost full-time, um, who tracks samples via the tracking um, software. There's probably better ways to do it, and we're looking at those. But right now, we know if a specimen is sort of in transit and, gets, and disappears or gets lost or stops moving. And so that's what we have right now. We're looking at some better ways to, to do that type of um, tracking, but that's what we do. Does that answer the question, I hope? Well, I'll take a second. I echo that. You know, we use New, uh, UPS in New Jersey as well, um, and we are also working with UPS, and Michelle and I talk all the time, to identify better, more transparency in the system between the hospital and the state. Uh, unfortunately, packages do get lost, and... I think Michelle would agree that the idea is trying to identify those lost packages and affected specimens as quickly as possible, um, and tracking is key to that. Right, and the other thing that, um, oh, I'm echoing, the other thing that comes to mind also um, to me is if orders were electronic and if a sample or there was a data entry, a remote data entry from the hospital at least to give us a a snapshot of what's being sent, we would know that it didn't arrive within a day or, or two at the very most, and we would be able to monitor it that way. We do have a couple hospitals that do that right now. They do remote entry or HL7. Um, but that is another way that you'd be able to track samples coming. Um, UPS has been quite helpful in, in helping us in understand the urgency of it. And because of this whole timeliness effort, a lot of our hospitals are um, aware and get reports from us to show what turnaround times are for the pre-analytic phase. And so they're watching as well. So we have several several points along the way where people are paying attention. All right. Um, are there any more questions? While we give another second to see if any more questions come in, I would like to remind everybody that the webinar the webinar was recorded. 
and that a link will be provided uh, after the webinar is posted, the recording is posted to the website. Um, we have another question that just came in. What is the best way to address timeliness of specimens? We have been having issues with UPS. The specimens are taken on time but get to newborn screening late. That is a good <laughs> question. <laughs> um, like I said, we've been we have regular calls with UPS at, at, and at various points along there, various people along the way are in tune with what's going on. So there's issues sometimes with pickup. The things I would recommend is that uh, you're very, you, you know who your local rep is, and if you're in New York, we could get you that information if you don't have it. Uh, your local center. <clears throat> it, um, you can arrange for specific pickup times so that you know you have to do your work processes in the hospital and get samples to one point. Now, I'm not saying it's 100% fail safe, but for the most part, hospitals have set times with their drivers. They have regular drivers. Sometimes there's issues when there's a substitute driver. Um, and communicate with the program as well, because we spend a lot of time on our end watching things move. Um, you know, I, I can't give you recommendation for how to make it work perfect, but I can, we can help you with things that you might think about or things that you might follow to make sure that you know that when your job is done and the baby samples are handed off, that the next process is moving along. <clears throat> um, we don't seem to have any more questions coming in. So um, I want to remind everyone also that at the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive a link for an evaluation. We greatly appreciate you taking a few short minutes to complete that and give us some feedback on the webinar you saw today. The slide in front of you shows you information about the next webinar. The next webinar, the NIMAC Timeliness Series, is going to be held on August Wednesday, August 10th. This webinar will be starting at 1 p.m. Uh, that's a change in time from our previous webinars. So it will be starting at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, August 10th. And we'll cover post-analytic timeliness in newborn screening. It's going to be presented by Drs. Robert Ostrander and Dr. David Cron. Dr. Ostrander is from the New York, New York State Academy of Family Physicians and the Valley View Family Practice. Dr. Cron is the director of the Biochemical Genetics Program at the New York Medical College Regional Medical Genetics Center in Valhalla, New York. So I greatly appreciate everybody's time today, and we hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you.